Okay, we can make a start now, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, our speaker today uh, is, uh, we're actually very lucky to have this sister. I'm actually quite, you know, quite happy we've got someone like of her calibre in the Muslim community doing the work that she does. Uh, sister Zara Faris, she's a graduate from the Arabic and Islamic Studies from Soas University. And uh, she, uh, she's also lived in Egypt for a year studying the Arabic language. And she's now a researcher and international speaker for the Muslim Debate Initiative. And uh, she's, she's also, very interestingly, Kurdish Pakistani origin as well. Um, she, uh, currently, she's doing a lot of lectures across the country, you know, universities, debates, other like uh, uh, different types of non Muslims, you know, like uh, feminists and all sorts. So, um, uh, she's also done a lot of uh, uh, TV work as well, so Muslim World Network TV as well. Uh, one of my favorite debates I've watched at the Zara Faris is Do Women Need Feminism with Green Party leader Nat Natalie Bennett. Bennett. And I'll urge you guys to watch that as well on YouTube. It's very interesting. Uh, also, she's done a lot of international work as well. Worked in Ireland, spoken and debated in Germany, and uh, also New Zealand, and quite recently Malaysia as well. So uh, today's topic is uh, feminine or feminism. So it's a question mark. So I want to introduce, uh, welcome, so Sister Zara Spice. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Just having a malfunction with my laptop just, uh, It's just gone blank <laughs> Just bear with me for a moment, there we are Okay um, thank you for the invitation to come out here to Birmingham. It's really nice to be here at this centre. You have a lot of activities, I understand, going on. So it's really an honour to be part of this. So Jazakumullah khair for having me here today and for picking a very interesting title, Feminist or Feminine. We often have the discussion about feminism in general or separately we might have the discussion about um, femininity and masculinity and gender roles as a separate subject but rarely we bring them together and say what is the relationship between these two is there really a conflict and if there is a conflict is it for the reasons we might think um, and various other questions that come out of this which we'll, which we'll talk about today now when we get to it the real question that comes out of this title feminist or feminine is whether gender differences are a sign of inequality. I'll explain what I mean. Now, feminism often describes itself as a movement that calls for equality between men and women. We often hear this definition, whether we agree fully with it or not, but this is often the definition that's put forward. And an increasing number of its groups, of its factions, claim that gender differences are actually a sign of inequality between men and women and therefore it's one of the hurdles to liberation of women so as long as there's differences between um, the way that women are and the way that men are apparently according to some of these um, feminist groups there can't be justice between them and Often by gender differences, they mean, for example, men and women either adopting different roles in society. So, for example, the male being the breadwinner and the female being the homemaker, or having different characteristics in their personality traits. For example, men perhaps being more risk-taking and women perhaps being more nurturing. These are some of the ideas that are often being referred to. And the argument that they're making is that... Um, for, for these types of feminists, is that gender differences um, are socially constructed or invented. In other words, these things don't have any grounding in reality or biology, but these are things which human beings have invented over time and have perpetually reinforced throughout generations. And this is how we end up where we are, according to, um, according to feminist theories. And so they say that... Um, specifically, rather, that these have not only been invented by human beings, but they've been invented more so by males in order to control females. This is often the argument that we hear. And therefore, wherever we find gender differences, we find inequality and injustice. And similarly, 
They may also claim that embracing femininity um, means that you couldn't really be interested in justice for women because you're embracing the very idea that apparently keeps women oppressed. So these are the um, ideas which are posited um, when the gender roles are being criticised from um, many feminist perspectives. But as an important caveat, if we're going to be honest when we're critiquing feminism, something that we must be aware of is that whilst this is one of the more mainstream opinions amongst feminism, not all feminist groups advocate this abolition of gender roles. It's something that if we're going to be critiquing feminism, we have to be honest about these and be aware of not applying this as a blanket argument, but it, it, it applies to a lot of the mainstream thoughts um, uh, amongst feminist theory. So for for example, just by way of example, there's some feminist groups which advocate that women should actually embrace their femininity if it means it will allow them to exert some sort of influence or power in society. So just to be aware of that as, as an aside. But again, also that is in the context of a battle kind of between men and women. So again, it's almost combative in a way. So the question we're going to be asking today off the back of this title is whether gender differences really are invented. Do they lead to injustices between men and women? And do they prevent us from being liberated? Does the breadwinner and homemaker scenario prevent liberation? Does it bring about injustice? Now, before we can understand the reality behind these questions, it's important to lay a very rational groundwork from which we can look at this topic. We can't just start from in midair grabbing terms as we think what they mean. We have to start from a strong foundation. And I'd like to start with the word liberation. Most people will be familiar with this word. It's a word that virtually every rights group will invoke. Every group that's jostling for its own territory will argue, um, will call for this idea of liberation, whether it's race or gender or human rights or whatever the group is, they're all calling for liberation. And everyone talks about wanting liberation very passionately. But very few talk about what it actually means. What does this term really mean? What is it we're looking to be liberated from? And what are we trying to be liberated to? And unfortunately, even fewer people question the basis of their concept of liberation itself. So let's think about this rationally. If by liberation, people mean freedom from external influences, so by external influences, for example, we could have the environment, um, you know, uh, weather, nature, you know, these things outside of us, then this is impossible because we're created inside the universe, not outside of it. We're created within this physical reality. We can't be liberated from um, a lot of these uh, forces of nature, let's say, for example, fire. We can't be liberated from the realities of fire. Fire is always going to burn. We take precautions against it, for example. And so in many ways, humans are shaped and limited by the external environments, by our families, by the way they bring us up when we're young. We don't really have a control over that. That's something which is an external influence on us. Society is an external influence on us. The climate is an external influence from us. Can we be liberated from these external influences? That's one question. The second is that if by liberation people mean freedom from internal influences, so for example human nature and genetics, then this is similarly absurd because human beings are to some extent, well, very much so, defined by some of these natural attributes. For example, social instincts, the basic need to eat. We can't and probably shouldn't be liberated from those things. It could be very harmful. Um, the real question, therefore, it's not whether we can attain liberation or freedom from either these internal or external influences, but the question is, which influences should we be embracing and which influences should, be, should we be rejecting? So the question, feminist or feminine, and the question behind many of these rights movements is really a question about how we should be living as human beings and how do we determine this? How do we understand the best way to live and the best way to ensure that we get what we need to do so, whatever, if it's rights, if it's you know um, anything like that, how do we understand this? And this can only be answered by examining the purpose of human beings themselves. And no movement can offer liberation or 
even offer a proper understanding of gender roles without understanding what human purpose itself actually is. It may seem like a huge leap backwards, but this is actually fundamental if we're going to understand these concepts properly and be able to deal with them going forward. Now, currently, what is uh, prevalent in um, uh, uh, Western civilization and Western philosophy um, is this idea or the dogma of individualism. I'll explain what that means. And essentially, feminism um, in, in its mainstream thought is a subset of this individualistic uh, philosophy. Now, individualism makes the assumption, essentially, that humans are merely individuals with no purpose except to exist as individuals. It doesn't really talk about higher purposes or serving uh, you know, a transcendent cause or a transcendent being such as God, for example. But if we think about it, let's deal with this rationally, as we are going to try to do with everything today. Humans, like cells in the body, aren't simply individuals. Your cell in your body, sure, it may be, you may have you know, individual cells in your body, but in of themselves, what are they? Unless you're looking at the construction of the human being, then it really becomes something. Similarly, human beings aren't merely individuals floating about on their own, independent of others. We are social creatures. We're defined by society, by culture, parents, genetics, the languages we're taught. No human being can learn to speak without the assistance of another human being. So we're not very individual or, or independent there, even from the time we are small children till the time we're old, we're dependent on other people. We're creatures that have a lot of instinctive needs that can only be fulfilled by other human beings. We aren't, again, you know, a solo sort of a train on a, you know, a, a solo cart rolling along a train track. We are interdependent on other people. And this is why, for example, um, solitary confinement is one of the most, is considered one of the most inhumane punishments because you're disconnected from human reality. You may think you have all you need within you, but actually it's, uh, you know, it's, it's considered by, by um, uh, many standards a punishment to be isolated on your own. So seeing as human beings were created in the universe, along with our nature, along with genetics, we didn't create the universe or our own nature or genetics. We are really um, mostly passive recipients of these realities. To a large extent, we're just passively you know, dealing with whatever comes at us from, from all these sides, to, a, to, to an extent. And there's no escape from many of these things. So individualism's claim to put the individual or the human being above these realities is what it calls liberation. And I'll explain why, but this becomes one of its biggest delusions. And it leaves us almost orphans from our higher purpose. To say that we are somehow above reality and as a singular being, um, you know, independent of it, it leaves us uh, with meaningless, potentially meaningless, you know, lives, vulnerable to uh, oppression from those who simply happen to be stronger than us in society. So does feminism offer a purpose for women? And can it really claim to understand what women who are part of the human species actually need? And then can it even go on to explain anything about gender roles? Because again, before we go to gender roles, does feminism even have an understanding of human reality? This is a fundamental question. Now, feminism, as I mentioned earlier, being based on individualism, claims that it also wants to free the individual from all of these imposing influences that I mentioned. So for example, God, culture, society, gender roles. And as I mentioned, they will argue that gender roles are socially constructed so that human beings are really born as blank slates. And any differences between male attributes and female attributes are learned as you grow up, often to the disadvantage of the female. Now, feminism, unfortunately, doesn't hold either any agreed upon or uh, objective or positive ideas about human purpose. Because of this call for individualism, consequently, it doesn't hold any ideas about human beings or specifically female humans should be living. And in this ideological void, because now it's got this hole, it, has an ex it doesn't have an idea for how humans should live and therefore there's this gaping void in its ideology. 
And so what happens is that um, many, many feminists ironically adopt imitation. So it ends up being um, making men and male roles the object of, of emulation. So in this void, what do we do? We don't know. Well, this is what men are doing. Let's imitate that because that's what we don't have. So maybe that's what we should be doing to, to get our rights. Often this is how it manifests. And there are, of course, some serious problems with these ideas. And this is what makes feminism incapable of uh, advising society on femininity and masculinity. So let's understand these problems, and there's three. The first problem is the problem of meaning and purpose. Now, simply saying, as often um, uh, feminist movements do, that women can do as they wish and give themselves their own meaning it leaves people in sort of a floating void in, you know, in the atmosphere. It's like having a dictionary full of words but no definitions. Make it up. That's not useful, really. Especially it's not useful given that the purpose of human existence is to interact with other human beings. If, for example, you don't have agreed uh, concepts or agreed ideas between people, it's going to be impossible to function in, in human society. So if you offer human beings an ideology without any valid purpose or meaning as to how they should be living, this leaves you more open to and vulnerable to those social forces which are giving rise to problems in the first place because you have no defence mechanism, no ideology with which to uh, challenge some of those influences. And feminism unfortunately hasn't been able to liberate women from this causality Rather, it's created new social pressures. We'll see some of them. And really, it's constituted in some ways a new form of oppression against women. So, for example, um, many feminists advocate that, not all, but many feminists advocate that women should be able to wear whatever they want and they can reject social norms of propriety. And unfortunately, this has opened Pandora's box for female exploitation with you know, the fashion and media industry turning women into basically one-dimensional, you know, um, uh, objects for, you know, visual pleasure, turning them into mass consumers. And new social pressures of beauty have caused the rise of eating disorders amongst women, with girls aged only as young as 15 having one of the highest rates of eating disorders. Um, and it so much makes the woman hate her own body that all kinds of of plastic surgery in the most intimate of areas has become, you know, one of the rapid, most uh, fastest growing industries um, in the UK and the US. And although some feminists do recognize these social pressures, they have some campaigns like against page three, etc., etc., they don't really know how to challenge it without compromising the idea of individual freedom in the first place. If you're calling for individual freedom, and then others are exercising their individual freedom and that hampers your cause, you can't then complain about that because it's the same ideology which you are calling for. Another example, um, many feminists, as I mentioned earlier, claim that female liberation means being identical to male roles. And what this has done is that it's made it almost incumbent or it's made it like necessary on women to be successful career women and unfortunately belittling those women who choose to be full-time parents and it belittles them as somehow not achieving their full potential oh she's only a mother she's not really you know doing everything she could do in life she doesn't have a job or, or a fantastic career and somehow are made to feel some women such women are made to feel that they're letting society down or that they're letting even themselves down somehow so this is perpetual feeling they're carrying around that I'm not doing everything I could be doing, I'm not doing what that woman is doing. Now, one um, very famous feminist, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, who catapulted the feminist movement, she wrote about this specifically and said, no woman should be authorized to stay at home to raise her children. So she's saying women shouldn't be allowed to stay home and raise children. Women shouldn't have that choice, she says. And she explains, she says, precisely because if there is such a choice, too many women will make that one. So she's saying that she wants to force women in a certain direction by making women feel it's unacceptable to stay at home and raise children, as if this is a very small thing to be doing, an insignificant thing to be doing. 
Now, can this arbitrary imitation of the male role, just simply saying, oh, because men work, maybe that's what will fulfill me, can that really make women happier? Now, studies would show that it doesn't. Studies show that women in, uh, for example, business leadership roles are reported as 47% more likely to suffer from depression than men in the same jobs. Feminism also can't liberate people from some of the injustices called, uh, caused by the capitalist system. So even if you had an all-female society with no men in it whatsoever, you would still have an unjust gap between the rich and the poor. This is just the way that the system works. Whether it's male or female is irrelevant. Who is at the helm is irrelevant. It's still causing this uh, injustice between people. And feminism doesn't really posit an alternative system for this. Islam does, as, as we'll see. Because in this system, or in this ideology of feminism, all they're arguing for is an equal representation in an already unjust system. So rather than standing for social justice and challenging the economic system that's essentially enslaved millions of men in debt, all they've done is served up women for, for exploitation as well, because now it's almost necessary for women to work. For example, in London, there's no way, of, it's very difficult for a family to get by on just one person's salary. You need two. It's just become the reality because of the uh, economic system. And now, essentially, the powerful elite gets to slave, uh, enslave, exploit and tax the female half of society too, which I wouldn't really describe that as progress. If it, so it sounds like they don't really care that the cake overall is poisoned as long as they get at least half of it. So that's the first problem, the problem of meaning and purpose, whereby it seems that many of these feminist movements don't have an idea to posit for human meaning and purpose and how we should be living. And so it can't really advise on secondary subjects or, or further subjects as to you know uh, what role should be. The second problem is perhaps... Um, most uh, in sync with the title of this, of this uh, discussion, Feminist or Feminine. The second problem is a problem of biological reality. Now, almost all living creatures have organised gender roles in some way with different biological abilities. This is just, you know, if, if anyone's ever watched David Attenborough's Observations of Wildlife, any animal, you'll see that there is a difference between the male and the female species. Um, interestingly, with uh, birds, for example, the male is usually more ornate and elaborate and the female is plain and the male tries to, to woo the female. With different animals, it's different, but there always seems to be this dimorphism or this difference between the male and the female species. And yet, feminists somehow are ideologically compelled to claim that humans are exempt from this natural order and that gender differences, as I mentioned, are purely inventions and biological differences between men and women should not inform social roles whatsoever. But we know this is plainly wrong. For example, the predominance of testosterone in males has been scientifically shown and proven not just to build physical muscle, but also to increase psychological competitiveness, confidence and risk-taking, which makes men generally, not all of them, but generally, as a rule, um, more equipped to tackle the more hazardous and competitive roles of society. And psychologists also found, for example, that even girls who were exposed to very high levels of testosterone whilst they were still in the womb, so they're not born yet, but they showed more male typical behaviours when they were um, kids and playing around. Um, so, for example, increases in rough and tumble play and aggression and more male typical toy preferences. So clearly hormones and biology can't be ignored and can't be um, taken out of the, of the equation. So not only does the feminist claim that all women uh, compete for traditional male roles at the expense of traditional female roles, forces women to unfairly compare themselves to men. It's like, you know, we don't have, for example, mixed Olympics because men and women have different averages in different sports. It would be unfair to put them in the same and expect um, to have, you know, the, an equal number of champions. These are just human differences. It's unfair to make women compare themselves to men in some ways, and it's unfair to make men compare themselves to women in some ways. But what this has done is that it's 
caused um, it ignores women's own proclivities and their own benefits and advantages and it's made it much more difficult for women to commit to motherhood or spend time with their families. So this is the problem of biological reality and there's a couple more of those which will come up in, in the next point. But this point is slightly different. The third problem, so the first problem was the problem of meaning and purpose. The fact that feminism doesn't really offer a, a purpose, um, a, a, an explanation for human purpose. The second problem was the problem of biological reality. And the third problem is the problem of equality. Now, where does this obsession for absolute equality come from? We hear about equality a lot. Are we all biologically identical? No. Do any two people, regardless of gender, have equal strengths, weaknesses, or ability? No. Equality doesn't exist in nature. So why do any movements, including feminists, think that humans should be forced into homogenous boxes and equalized? Why is it presumed that equalizing everything will bring about justice? There's a big presumption here that hasn't really been challenged much. It's just the idea that if everything was equal, somehow everything would become more just. But even feminists realized that this doesn't really make sense when they saw that equal treatment of men and women still didn't yield the equal outcomes that they hoped for. So for example, even in the more meritocratic uh, environments and societies, women still preferred, they did some studies, and found that women still preferred a work-life balance that involved less hours than men, with many leaving their careers to pursue motherhood and family. And interestingly, and you know how I mentioned earlier that they argue that gender differences somehow indicate inequality? Almost in direct refutation of this, there have been studies which found that in the more developed and prosperous and what were considered to be egalitarian countries, they found that differences between male and female personalities were actually the greatest. So in those societies where women were supposedly given more egalitarian uh, options and more, more choices for how to live, they found that the disparity between the masculine and the feminine was actually greater. So the female characteristics were more accentuated and the male characteristics were more accentuated. And in the lesser developed countries, the differences between the male and female personalities was much less. So it really makes you question this idea that somehow differences equals inequality. So some, just a couple of examples, some of the characteristics they found amongst, um, uh, amongst more men in developed countries included some of the ones I mentioned earlier, risk-taking, assertiveness, these were found to be more in men. Tender-mindedness and anxiety were found more amongst women. And it's interesting, if you think about these qualities, they actually complement and temper one another. With risk-taking, you have to have a level of anxiety to stop you doing ridiculous things like running across a dual carriageway. And with anxiety, you have to have some level of risk-taking to encourage you to cross a road in the first place. So already we're getting hints that there is an inter interdependence that is necessary between people and that these qualities don't have to all exist within one person in order for society to function. They can exist amongst different people. So these studies um, are really fascinating. The fact seems to, or the facts, the findings of these studies contradict directly the arguments that somehow, you know, gender differences equals gender inequality. And yet feminists insist on, on either hiding or ignoring or not responding to these realities by claiming perhaps that women were forced to make these choices. Oh, in more developed countries, somehow women were forced to make choices that revolved more around the home, which sounds like an, um, you know, a strange argument to make, given that these countries were where they had more options. Another very important difference, men and women, when we're talking about you know, equality, as a fact, they do not walk away from adult relationships on an equal footing. The woman, for example, is more likely to be having more responsibilities, for example, if she's with child. Now, instead of calling for better contractual safeguards for women, feminism has instead so-called empowered women to have casual relationships without commitment. In this call for independence and individualism and fulfilling your own um, 
uh, ideals or living your own life, it's empowered people to be more active in these um, arenas without necessarily asking for commitments. And this leaves women often quite literally holding the baby. Now, whilst feminists demand the full suite of reproductive rights for women, for example, the right to decide whether to keep, abort or give away their children, they reserved only the financial obligations for men. So uh, in the UK, a woman has an automatic right to her child, regardless of whether she's married or not, but it imposes an automatic obligation on the man to pay child support whilst denying him a right to a relationship with his children. So in the eyes of the law, he doesn't have an automatic right to a relationship with his biological children like the mother does, but he has an automatic financial obligation towards them. In effect, a tax without representation. So how is this equality? And how is this the abolition of gender roles? Is this not enforcing gender roles and enforcing uh, an inequality between them? If you're really going to be consistent and ignore biology, then why do they advocate special rights for women based on biology, the fact that they had the child? You can't have it both ways. So there's a, there's a strong inconsistency here. And it's not just legally, and it's not just the fact that the woman is, is the one that, that carries a child. There are studies which found that women actually experience a chemical bond when they are with a partner, which actually increases her attachment to that particular individual, whether he's appropriate for her or not. Again, biology seems to be getting involved in the so-called individualism of, of human beings. Whether that person is right for her or not, chemically, in women, they will experience a bond and an attachment that makes it very difficult to make proper decisions about what to do. So we can't escape biology, and biology doesn't always manifest equally in both men and women. Now, moving away from biology and back more strongly to equality, um, also consider the uh, female quotas, for example, for polished uh, boardroom jobs. But the distinct lack of quotas for jobs that Feminists simply didn't want to do garbage collection, animal slaughter, coal mining, etc., etc. It's a very selective application of these quotas and this call for equality. Um, consider the uh, campaigns, uh, the feminist campaigns for women to receive the lion's share of institutional support for, for example, um, domestic violence, cancer research, rape support, and so on, which is fine if it were not for the fact that men are vulnerable at similar or higher rates, but we just don't hear about it because the focus is not there. So where is the equality? So it's ironic, unfortunately, that if feminism is supposed to be a response to injustice, it's unfortunately adopted some of the same uh, uh, characteristics of the so-called oppressors that they are seen to be um, uh, advocating against. So does this sound like a movement that can liberate women or that can advise women on what it means to be feminine and what it means to be masculine? I think the answer is no. But what about Islam? What does Islam do to liberate us? How does Islam answer these questions? Now, we talked about causality and how feminism doesn't really liberate us from that. It leaves you victim to causality. But rather, Islam, on the other hand, liberates us from this by making us uh, submit, regardless of gender, whether you're male and female, first and foremost, as a baseline to the ultimate cause, the creator, uh, God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it gives us a purpose that's higher than selfish individualism, and it gives direction to both men and women. It provides us with a clear moral yardstick, a justification for what is right and wrong, and a holistic method to achieve that, and one that is in tune with human nature of both men and women. As an example, uh, God says in the Quran, when he's granting this fundamental equality to both men and women, I do not waste the deed of any among you, be they male or female. The one of you is as the other. So whilst men and women in the Quran are largely addressed the same in Islam, um, where we are asked to seek virtue and to bring about justice, it only addresses us differently, only addresses men and women differently in those few areas in which men and women are in fact different. So prayer, zakat, all of those shared obligations, these are things which men and women have, you know, the duty to, to, to command good and, and forbid um, what, is, what is not good. However, it gives 
different instructions where men and women are different to accommodate for the differences between men and women. So, for example, Islam doesn't give a blanket privilege. It doesn't say that one person has authority over another just for the sake of it. Rather, it only gives um, authority if it gives a commensurate responsibility. So, for example, the leader of a group of people may have a certain amount of authority over the others, but they have the same amount of accountability. So anything that they do with that power, it's like Spider-Man, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. It's the same, wherever in Islam someone is given an authority, they have the same amount of responsibility. So while males, for example, are given gender roles of maintenance and protection over women, Islam liberates women by giving them mandatory rights over men as well. So, for example, God provides in the Quran, women shall have rights similar to the rights against them according to what is equitable. So, unlike the individualistic movements that we looked at earlier, Islam recognizes that we rely on one another. And most women are likely, for example, at some point in their life, the majority, although not all, for example, Aisha radiallahu anha did not go through, um, you know, have uh, go through motherhood per se, literally. But most women are likely to experience childbirth and motherhood due to their biology. And Islam aims to ensure that they are supported by way of the man who's not going to experience those things, but supported by way of him continuing to provide, etc., etc. It doesn't straightjacket you into these roles. A woman can adopt many roles in society in order to please a creator, but one of the biological realities of being a woman is that you are likely to experience these things, and so God has provided a way for you to be cared for and looked after during this time. Now, a very quick um, uh, analogy to explain how these rights and duties are balanced between men and women. And this is actually from Chinese mythology or Buddhist mythology, but the story itself is really, it really epitomizes the way that it's balanced in Islam. So, um, what, just before I start that, what um, time is, are we going we to got, break for? Uh, I, wanna, I wanted to finish for eight. So if you want to just maybe close up. So yeah, minutes, that should be fine. We've got a few minutes for question and answers. Okay, sounds good. Um, now, there's a story of a man who, his life comes to an end and he was a Buddhist. He goes up to Chinese, um, the heavens, and he's met there by a Chinese angel. And the angel says to him, okay, um, you know, it's time to go to wherever you're gonna go, whether it's heaven or hell, he doesn't know yet. And he said, wait, 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 before you do that, I just wanna see, it's like, can you show me what hell looks like? And the angel is just like, are you sure? He's like, yes, I, I need to see, I need to see both before I go, so I want to know, you know, either way, what I'm, you know, avoiding or missing. So the angel takes him first, and he says, okay, here's the doors to Chinese hell. And the man opens the door and goes inside, and inside it's like long tables stretching up and down a hall, like in Harry Potter or Cambridge dinner halls, you know, those long tables. And he sees on these tables all this wonderful food laid out, fresh, steaming, beautiful food. And he looks back and he asks, is this definitely hell? And he says, yes, this is hell, keep watching. And so he's looking at all this food, all types of cuisine you can imagine. And on both sides of the tables, there are you know, men and women sitting. And uh, he sees that these people have really long chopsticks, really, really long, and they're all struggling because they're trying to reach down and get the food with these chop chopsticks. But by the time they've got it on the end, they can't reach up and put it in their mouth because the chopstick is just too long, it misses, and they're having a terrible time being tempted by all this food and not being able to enjoy any of it. And so they're all really basically being tortured. And the man thinks this is really strange and he exits backwards very quickly and he says, okay, can I see Chinese heaven now? And the man takes him to another door and uh, the angel takes him to another door, the man goes inside. And again, the same tables, really long tables covered in the most beautiful, exquisite foods you can imagine, steaming, fresh, crunchy, warm, all kinds of desserts, anything you can imagine. And again, there's people sitting up and down the rows of tables, and he thinks, well, what are, you know, and they're all, they're, all, they're all enjoying themselves. They're eating the food and having a good time, and he's just, how are they doing this? How comes in the other room they were so miserable, they had all the same things, the same food, what are they doing here? 
And again, in heaven, they had these very long chopsticks. But in Chinese heaven, they were picking up the food and reaching across the table and feeding each other. And that way they were all able to enjoy what they wanted to enjoy because they were looking after each other and looking out for each other. And similarly in Islam, rights and duties are balanced in this way. We're not selfish individuals seeking to satisfy our own femininity or our own masculinity and only asking for our, our own rights. Rather, we understand that our rights can only be satisfied by another human being fulfilling that for us, and their rights can only be satisfied by us doing the same for them. So, to wrap up, unfortunately, feminism doesn't really give any critical rights that women can expect from their partner in marriage. So, as a, as, as a feminine, as a woman, it doesn't guarantee something that the masculine has to give her. However, Islam liberates women by giving, them, uh, giving her the right to have her, her needs fulfilled by her partner in marriage. For example, the right to respect, affection and time from her husband. The right to time and affection from her husband. Islam says that this is a right for a woman that her husband has to give her. The right to physical satisfaction by her husband. The right to shelter provided by her husband. The right to food and clothing equal in quality to, uh, to her husband's. The right to physical protection provided by her husband. The right to dowry and alimony. And men have some reciprocal rights the same from women, although not in terms of shelter and providing, but also time, affection, etc., etc. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, what do you command about our wives? He, peace be upon him, said, give them food from what you have for yourself, clothe them by that which you clothe yourself, do not beat them and do not insult them. And Islam liberates women from the causalities to do with sexual objectification, of um, you know, commercialization. It allows women to pursue not just the worship of God through any pathway she wants. She can be a business a CEO, a judge, a political minister, can join the army, or she can be a mother, and none of these things are superior to the other. The only thing that matters is the sincerity with which you discharge your duty. Whether you are a man ruling the nation or a mother bringing up one child, there's no superiority between those two roles. The only difference is how you um, uh, administer that role. I had a bit more I'd wanted to say, but I think I have to conclude, unfortunately. Um, but what we can see is that gender differences they are far from indicators of inequality. To have a gender difference does not mean inequality. And not only are these gender differences, apparently, you know, from these studies, seem to be more obvious in the more prosperous societies, but these gender differences, because they are based in biology often and understandings of human reality, they are inescapable. And they reflect very important differences between men and women. And differences which, if we understand properly, enable us to fulfill our needs by working together, by helping one another in order to serve our Creator. And the only call uh, for, for justice should be when these rights, either the men's rights or the women's rights, are not being fulfilled, but we have to work within the rubric of what Islam provides because it, God, our Creator, for some reason understands us really well. <laughs> Maybe because he created us and he understands what we need from each other. So this is the, the framework from which we should be understanding how to liberate from, from unjust circumstances. So Jazakumullah khair for your time um, and uh, thank you. Yeah. Jazakumullah khair for our sister Zara. That was a fantastic presentation, mashallah. Uh, just a few minutes for question and answers. So if anyone's got any questions, uh, uh, we'll start with Naweed. Firstly, Jazakallah Head for the, the talk, it was really uh, interesting and inspiring. Uh, just a quick question on your thoughts actually, uh, as a Muslim sister. Um, do, you believe as, uh, do you believe Muslim women are becoming more feminist orientated? And part two to that question is, do you believe that uh, that's impacting on the delay in them getting married as well? Um, that's a big question <laughs> for a few Sorry, minutes. No. That's okay. Um, there are many movements which are becoming more pervasive amongst um, young Muslims, and a lot of them are rights-based movements. So not just feminism, but you know, a lot of ideas about you know, um, uh, a lot of entitlement kind of movements where people are thinking more about the rights that are due to them and their sense of entitlement. 
And this is taking people away from the proper understanding about, about how to live. And, and one of those manifestations is feminism. However, there is perhaps more so an increasing understanding of the proper um, uh, Islamic opinion or proper Islamic understanding of how humans should be living as well. So it's okay to call for women's rights and men's rights, provided you do it in balance. You're not just saying women's rights, women's rights, but maybe gender rights or justice between men and women. For example, Mohammed Bouaziz, the guy who set off the Arab Spring, he was a man, one of many, and there have been many instances since, who set himself on fire because he wanted to provide for his family. But at that point, nobody came out and said, oh, this is a men's rights issue. But rather, because of this uh, influence of um, you know, the, a lot of the, the feminist, um, more what we can call Western feminism, because of these influences, it's causing people to see things maybe through a particular lens where certain, in certain injustices are more highlighted and others just go unnoticed. And so this may be why it seems that people are more focused on, on women's rights and, and feminism and things like that. Um, so there, to some extent, there is that sort of, um, it's kind of an, an asabiya in a way, a kind of, a type of nationalism, but a nationalism for your gender, where you kind of blind to the things which are happening to the other gender and you're only really thinking about your own. So this does, this does exist, but I think these kinds of misconceptions have always existed. And it takes the proper understanding of Islam to correct those presumptions. And if someone has a passion to see justice being done, that's a great thing. But it's more important that that thing is done properly. Um, in terms of delaying, um, delaying marriage, I think that there are other things which are causing, as a, as a, as a you know, having been, an, I guess, an observer um, of society and, and, and increasing what seems to be a problem where people are not getting married, or are delaying marriage. I think this is not a cause of feminism, but rather because of individualism, um, where even maybe uh, men are becoming more individualistic, as are many, um, many women and many men. The idea that you don't really want to change the way you live, the idea of responsibility is just, you know, you don't really want that on your plate when you can, you know, kind of get everything you need. Um, so it's not necessarily directly and only feminism, but rather those movements which have individualism at the core can bring about this, this fear of commitment and this not wanting to settle down sort of thing. So um, it's important to understand individualism as one of the, well, that's really the bedrock from which all these other ideologies come from. There's also a, a, a so-called men's rights movement, which is uh, kind of very cross with the results of feminism, but has set itself up almost as an exact opposite of feminism. And again, the problem with that is the idea of individualism, because they're all calling for their own rights, not figuring out how to work together properly. Um, and so these are causing some of the delays and some of the problems in people working together and getting married. Any other questions from the sisters? You agree with everything you said, no question raised. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, very good. If anyone wants to ask any questions afterwards, um, I'll be around for a few minutes.